We will start in 1 Thessalonians 1, and we will start verse 6. Let us go ahead and read that together. 1 Thessalonians 1, chapter 1, starting in verse 6. Let us read that together. Paul says, You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. Verse 8, he says, For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, he says, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. Isn't that amazing? We have no need to say anything. What an amazing way to, to end uh, this little section on instruction. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us seek the Lord before our time together today. Merciful Father, Lord, we beg that you would help us now to understand your word and to preach your word Father, I pray that your body would be edified, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ would be strengthened by no other than your word. And Father, I pray that you would just use me as a vessel of communication from which your powerful word lands upon us so mightily. And I pray that it would transform our minds, soften our hearts, and issue forth in godliness all by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, bless our time today. Help us, Father, to cling to your promises with confidence and to speak the way we ought to speak because our hope is so great. Oh, Lord, bless our time in your word, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are going to go ahead and get started just to prepare you ahead of time we have quite the journey to go today. Um, might be my longest sermon. I feared, even a couple sermons ago, I looked back at, at just, just the, the record we have, and it was like an hour and seven minutes. So I applaud you of staying in your seat for an hour and seven minutes. And even our children, they do, they do so well. We've, this, is, this is not disciplining your children in patience. I don't know what is. This is, this is doing it. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Now, we are, we are in the series. The series is called The Tongue. And today we are looking at the power of evangelistic speech. And that is the title of my sermon. It is the power of evangelistic speech. And we're going to go through evangelistic speech. And I have four points for us to go through that I want us to survey briefly today. And that is these four points. Evangelistic speech is prayerful, number one. Evangelistic speech is prayerful. Evangelistic speech is loving. Evangelistic speech is loving. Number three, evangelistic speech is bold. And number four, lastly, evangelistic speech is uncompromising. It is uncompromising, and this is by no means exhaustive. I, I, I was thinking about, I could, I, you could literally do evangelistic speech is, is obedient, it is dignified, you can look at speech in so many different ways, but for the sake of time, I have chose prayerful, I have chose loving, I have cho chosen bold and uncompromising. And with that being said, I just want to get into our little preface here that I hope Everyone is enjoying this series and, and enjoying what the word of our God has to say concerning the tongue. And so even, even though this, this, this study hasn't been exhaustive, I do hope it's been edifying. I do hope it's been instructive, and it, it really is amazing. I know I began by, by just, by just kind of laying forth how, uh, how transtestamental or how, uh, how encompassing the word of God is in on our speech and how in the Old Testament to the New Testament, God has so much to say with how we speak and how we use our tongues. And here we are on the fourth and final surface and just beginning to scratch the surface on the material. And so I, um, I just want to exhort you, continue to study, continue to meditate on what's been preached and develop um, this 
theology on the tongue, how to be pleasing to the Lord with our lips by cultiv- cultivating a faithful heart toward Him in all of life. And so we looked at the power of the tongue in, in week one. We looked at the power of unholy speech in week two. And last week we looked at the power of holy speech, and today we look at the power of evangelistic speech. And as we come to this final sermon, what I want to do next is just survey where we have been so far. You know, it can be so easy to go from sermon to sermon and kind of leave behind what we have learned, where we have studied. But I want to, uh, but if we are going to learn as disciples, we need to frequent the same material over and over, right? We must continually bathe ourselves in the truth. So in the words of the Apostle Paul, to write the same things again is no trouble for me. Now, I just want to begin here. In the space of seven points, quickly enumerate some of the things we have learned in over the last three weeks. Are you ready? Here we go. Point number one. The Bible teaches that in every moment of life, the heart always has a representative ready to do its bidding which is the tongue. The heart is that which feeds the tongue like a teleprompter, the content it will communicate. That is truth number one. Number two, you say what you say because you are what you are. And we brought that axiom, even though we said you do what you do because you are what you are, but I'm just changing that slightly to say, you say what you say because you are what you are. We brought that axiom out of Jesus' own teaching, namely that the spiritual quality of the fruit we bear is determined by the spiritual quality of the tree you are. Do you see that? that the fruit is dependent upon the root. You say what you say because you are what you are. It is the root of who you are that, that determines the fruit of what you do. Therefore, how you use your tongue most often will reveal the real state of your heart. The fruit will be consistent with the root. Number three, a healthy heart is a prerequisite for healthy speech. A healthy heart is a prerequisite for healthy speech. If ever the content of your mouth would be changed, your heart must be changed first. And no, I was just talking with some sisters today, you cannot change your heart. You cannot change your heart. Only God can change and soften a hard heart, and only God can bring life to what is dead. And so sinners are completely at the mercy of God for what they so desperately need because it is Him and Him alone who can give it to them. It is only the Lord who can give it to them, and if that leads you to believe that salvation is impossible with man, then good, because it is. Even the disciples are on the brink of despair when Jesus is teaching them about, well, then how can a rich man enter the kingdom of heaven, right? He says that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. He says, get into the kingdom of heaven. He, then that their response was, then who can be saved? And Jesus says, exactly what is impossible with you is possible with God. And that is the good news of the gospel, is that we are weak and we are impotent, but we have a God who is mighty to save. We have a God who is powerful to save. Salvation is of the Lord alone. Number four, we study that Christians can bridle their tongues. We can bridle our tongues, and we are all somewhere on the spectrum of sanctification with regard to our speech and the Lord sanctifying what we say. And so Christians can bridle their tongues, and maturity in Christ, the more we grow in Him, Maturity in, maturity in Christ gives us the ability to stumble less with our mouths. And so the more we entrust ourselves to the Spirit and walk in Him, the more success we will enjoy and the more victory we will experience with regard to what we say. 
Number five, because of the nature of, of a teaching ministry, the tongue and our speech being most predominantly on display, those who would be teachers must first examine themselves with a sober self-assessment before pursuing an office or function of teaching because God will judge them more strictly. That is number five. And then number six, we learn, though the tongue is small, yet it is powerful. On the one hand, if it is unrestrained, it has the power to destroy and be used for great evil. And then on the other hand, if subject to the Spirit, it has the power to edify and be used for unparalleled good. And then lastly, number seven, the chief end of the tongue is to glorify God in our prayers, in our praises, and in our proclamations of his truth to one another and the world around us. That is the chief end of the tongue. It is to glorify God in our prayers, in our praises, and in our proclamations of his truth to one another and the world around us. Our tongues were made to glorify God. They were made to glorify God. And so moving out of this preface to the sermon, some points that I want us to keep in mind as we survey into the, the introduction. So what I, wanna, what I want us to look at from here going forward is the topic of our sermon today, which is the power and manner of evangelistic speech. And I want to begin with this, is that you and I have an evangelistic duty you and I have an evangelistic duty, a personal responsibility to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so in terms of the missionary or evangelic or evangelistic endeavors of the church, the documents of the New Testament are the most beautiful documents in the world. Not only do they set forth the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, his coming, his living, his dying, his rising, but they also demonstrate how his finished work set in motion the missionary enterprise of the church. Not only do they set forth his redemptive work, but how that redemptive work set in motion the missionary enterprise of the church. Isn't that amazing? That way you see, you read the scripture, you get to see it all. You and I have the unparalleled privilege of reading about the Great Commission on one hand. Do you ever think about that? You and I have the unparalleled privilege of reading about the Great Commission on one page in our Bibles and then turning over a few pages to learn about a 30 to 40 year history of the Great Commission obeyed in the early church. That is, it is truly unfathomable what we have right here. Oh, we need to read it. We need to read it. We need to take it in and absorb it. It is so good. That is a great, great privilege. But what do we find? We go from Matthew 28, where Jesus says the Great Commission passage, one of five Great Commission passages, where Jesus says this, all authority has been given to me. He says, in heaven and on earth, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And he says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Fast forward there to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus, speaking to his apostles, he says this, he, he, says, he says, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, and then he starts making his way out, and in Judea, and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth, echoing the same great commission that would begin in the innermost parts of the region and explode by the power of the Holy Spirit and the message of Christ crucified and extend to the outermost parts of the earth. And that is exactly what we see in, in the history of the church in the book of Acts. 
we see the Great Commission on display and the King of Kings and Lord of Lords building his church. That is what he's doing. He is building his church and he is building his church as we labor together in the mission he has given us. And it's, and it's in this mission that we admire him, that we admire what the Lord Jesus is doing, that we exalt him along the way through all of our endeavors because he is worthy of glory. That is the heartbeat of the book of Acts. Jesus is worthy of glory. He is worthy of glory. I don't care if I have my skin ripped off. I don't care if I'm beaten and I'm stoned. He must be known because he is worthy of glory. Isn't that amazing? He is worthy of glory. He is worthy of every knee being bowed to his regal rule and every tongue's confession that he is Lord. He is worthy of that confession. And isn't that what our hearts hunger for? For the Lord to be magnified from the lips of sinners. The Lord to be magnified and the yearning of our hearts, our hearts is captured so well by that hymn, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. He says, my gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of Thy name. Those words represent the song of the redeemed, the heartbeat of our evangelism in our, in our lives. We want the world to know the Lord Jesus. And we see this was the very attitude in which the message of Christ crucified was preached in, in the Bible, to make Jesus known. Sinners to be converted in the this great commission that they were obeying in the book of Acts. What does the great commission entail? What does the great commission entail? And we can start by saying, just briefly, that the great commission is a charge to God's new covenant people to go into all the world to proclaim the gospel for the conversion of sinners, to formulate biblical churches in order to baptize and disciple believers while we preach and teach the full counsel of God for the upbuilding of the body of Christ. The Great Commission is a charge to God's new covenant people to go into all the world to proclaim the gospel for the conversion of sinners, to formulate biblical churches in order to baptize and disciple believers while we preach and teach the full counsel of God for the upbuilding of the body of Christ. And that is exactly what you see as you survey the New Testament. A church that has been commissioned by Christ, Christ to preach the gospel and make disciples, and that is where we find ourselves in the timeline of this history. That is where we find ourselves. God has saved us. Once God-hating, sin-loving people, God has saved us and he has given us a task to accomplish for his sake, and that is a privilege we are utterly unworthy of. We are utterly unworthy of that task. And I, I hope you let that sit on you, the magnitude of God's love for us. It is too much to bear. I don't, for all eternity, God will be exegeting. He will be He will be conveying, communicating. He will be revealing this great love with which he has saved us. And that will be the fuel that continues and sustains our worship to him eternally. It is absolutely amazing. Too much to bear the magnitude of the display of God's love 
toward us. Now, before we get into a couple of our points, I just want to show us an, ev- an example of evangelistic speech starting in the central text that we are working from, 1 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 10. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 10, because in this singular passage, you have an entire account of the gospel proclaimed, sinners converted, churches planted, disciples made, godly lives established, and then the gospel proclaimed by them. And then the gospel proclaimed by them. And so we see this domino effect where the gospel is preached, where sinners are converted and disciples are multiply. Look at this awesome example in scripture of the Great Commission at work, starting in verse 5, and I'm not going to comment too much, but I just want to show you the rhythm of this and how it is transpiring in this account that we have. And so verse 5, we have evangelism in the Great Commission. That's 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 5, where Paul says, and I could have started a little bit earlier, but this gets to the point of it. And verse five says, for our gospel, he says, did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And so we have this, this example of evangelism and the Great Commission going forth to those in Thessalonica. And so you see the result of their godly life and their gospel-centered speech and evangelism. Look at the next verse. What does it cause? You see conversion. You see imitation, which resulted in partnership in the Great Commission. Isn't that amazing? Conversion, imitation, and partnership in the Great Commission. And, and, and take note of the order that the godly life preceded the gospel proclamation, where he says in verse 6, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. An amazing dynamic here in scripture. He says, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And then you have, this is the evidence of their partnership in the Great Commission, which is found in their evangelism. So you go from their conversion to their imitation and their evangelism or partnership in the Great Commission. Verse 8, verse 8, Paul says, For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place toward God. He says, every place toward toward God, or your faith toward God, has gone forth so so that we have no need to say anything, right? Paul's point is that they got the point. That we have no need to say anything. Godliness in life and gospel proclamation in the world were present. He's basically saying, what else do I need to add to that? What more do I need to say to you if you have a godly life and you are proclaiming the gospel in the world? And as many have pointed out, one of the indications that you love the gospel and that you understand it is that you are sharing it. There is conviction that fuels your proclamation. This is what God has given to believers in in knowing the gospel, understanding the gospel, and loving the gospel is that you are sharing it. And in light of the sinner's inescapable and dreadful plight outside of union with Christ, you are sharing it with the hope that they will share your hope. In, in, In the hopes that they will have peace with God and be delivered from their condemnation that they would believe in the Lord Jesus, that they would possess eternal life. That becomes the attitude in which we preach the gospel and what compels us to go out into the highways and byways or your business or in your home to share the message. Love fuels that proclamation. Grace received fuels our evangelism. Fuels it. And it was from this frame of mind that Charles Spurgeon, he responded to one of his students answering a student's question. The question was this. He said, will the heathen who have not heard the gospel be saved? That was a a student asked him that asked him that question. Will the heathen who do not have the gospel, will they be saved? 
Charles Spurgeon, in controversial fashion, responded, it is more a question with me whether we who have the gospel and fail to give it to those who don't have the gospel can be saved. And I hope you see kind of what he's getting at. How can we as Christians be content in a silence that is deafening with regards to the gospel? How can we be content with that silence and say, we love the Lord Jesus Christ. We love the gospel. We don't love proclaiming the gospel. I just love it in my own heart. But nothing really compels me to give it to you who are perishing. You have to question their love, don't you? Do they truly understand the gospel? Do they truly know and love the gospel if they are indifferent and completely apathetic to sharing it where God has given these opportunities to share the gospel? And then we have to ask ourselves, have we grown a little apathetic to our duty? Have we grown loveless toward the lost? Commenting on this passage, I love this insight from G.K. Beale, who says, in light of the Thessalonian witness, he says, Paul was, in a manner of speaking, he was without a job, as we just, as we just read. He says, so that we have no need to say anything. Paul was, as it were, without a job, especially in nearby regions in which, the, in which both the Thessalonians and their own spiritual children, they were spreading the gospel. And he says, the main point of 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 10, is that Paul did not need to say anything. Such a main point, it sounds strange at first, but Paul's silence is a loud testimony to how effective the Thessalonians and their disciples were. Isn't that noteworthy? How silent he was to what they were doing. In terms of instruction, Paul is silent when the church is zealous and compassionate. You see that? He is silent when the church is zealous and compassionate, but when the church is silent, Paul has a lot to say. Paul has a lot to say. Those, he goes on, Paul, those who are not part of the formal church leadership sometimes wrongly think that they should be on the spiritual sidelines when it comes to witnessing to the outside world, as if it's only the pastor's job to preach the gospel, or the deacons, or maybe someone who is a, a noteworthy, maybe an evangelist or something. That there is sometimes there is wrong thinking in the church that they should be on the spiritual sidelines when it comes to witnessing to the outside world. On the contrary, he says, the testimony of the pastor and other church leaders, it must be joined, do you see that? It must be joined by the witness of many others in the church in order for the church's proclamation of the gospel to be effective on unbelievers in the surrounding area. It is not only the elders and the deacons, but it is, it is this, they are joined. It becomes it becomes the work of the church, no one excluded, everyone included for the work of evangelism. And then the last thing he says is, the new Christians in Thessalonica and the surrounding countryside, he says, could not keep a low profile about their faith. Don't you love that? They couldn't keep a low profile, right? They, they couldn't stop opening their mouths Concerning the Lord Jesus, he says, it was bursting at the seams and could not be contained. And if you look at just verse 9, you have confirmation. He says, for they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. And then he says, and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. That is the power of evangelistic speech. I will see you guys next week. <laughs> that is the power of evangelistic speech. But I don't want us to overlook the source of their evangelistic speech and zeal. It was reconciliation. It was the God who turned them from their sin and toward them 
turn them to Christ, as I said here, to, a, to serve a, a true, a living and true God. It was reconciliation through the life-giving and mind-renewing gospel of Jesus Christ, who is God incarnate. Now that we have looked at an example of evangelistic speech in terms of the Great Commission, I want us to look at some of the elements of evangelistic speech or powerful uses of the tongue for evangelistic purposes. And so from the example of the Thessalonians, we know that their godly life preceded their gospel proclamation. Their godly life came first. Their gospel proclamation uh, stemmed from that. And so when we go into maybe the elements of evangelistic speech, we cannot fail to remember when discussing evangelism how we even prepare ourselves from the outside. And that leads me to the first point, is, is this aspect, which is so important to evangelism, is my, the first point is evangelistic speech is prayerful. Evangelistic speech is prayerful. What you find in the Bible so consistently is how prayer precedes proclamation. Prayer precedes proclamation, or that prayer goes before proclamation or the preaching of the word. For instance, in Acts chapter 1, you have 120 disciples gathered in the upper room. They were devoting themselves to prayer waiting for the Holy Spirit to come in power and inaugurate the last day's fulfillment of Joel in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the proclamation of the word in Acts chapter 2. You have prayer, and then you have proclamation. In Acts chapter 6, in Acts chapter 6, the apostles called for a very primitive stage of deacons to serve so that they wouldn't be hindered in fulfilling their apostolic mission, which entailed steadfastly devoting themselves in this order to the ministry of prayer and the ministry of the word. So we have in Acts 1, prayer, Acts 2, the proclamation of the word. And then the priorities of the apostles was first the ministry of prayer and then the ministry of the word. They said, but we will devote ourselves, Acts 6, 4, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And expanding on that, Colossians 4 Chapter Colossians 4, verse 2, Paul said this. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in an attitude of thanksgiving. And he says in verse 3, praying at the same time for us as well. And this is what he prays for, that God will open up to us a door for the word. That God would open up for us a door for the word, he says, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I also have been imprisoned. And in verse 4, he adds to that, he says, and, and, th and that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. You see that oughtness that, that comes behind, that gives the force of the way we should speak. There's a way we ought to speak. He says, pray that I, might, that I may speak in a way that is fitting with the gospel of Christ. Pray that I might preach. And what's amazing about this, you have prayer and you have proclamation. And I love this passage because Paul is in prison. He is in prison for being faithful to God-ordained gospel opportunities while he is asking the Lord to pray for more opportunities to preach the gospel. He's exhorting the church to petition God that he would grant favor and sovereignly remove any hindrances for the urgent need of the hour. He is praying that God would grant favor and that he would remove any hindrances that remain, that the urgent need of the hour, which is the saving truth of the gospel, would continue to go forth that it would continue to go forth 
Do you see? He wants him to pray. He wants him to petition God that God would open up doors for the word. You sense the, the urgency. You, you sense the need for the gospel in these areas. Amy Carmichael, she said, we shall have all eternity to celebrate the victories, but we only have a few short hours before the sunset in order to win them. We shall have all eternity to celebrate the victories, but we only have the few hours before sunset in which to win them. And lastly, to the Thessalonians, Paul said, finally, 2 Thessalonians 3, uh, verse 1, Paul says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you. Isn't that amazing? Just as it did also with you. Essentially, Paul is saying, pray that a great multitude of sinners would experience what happened to you. That a great multitude of sinners would be ushered into the kingdom by the preaching of Christ and Him crucified. And so, though prayer is not in itself evangelism, It does ask God to grant opportunities to evangelize, and it begs God for sinners to be saved through the preaching of the gospel. That is why we pray for our lost neighbors and our lost family members, those who we know and love. We pray for their salvation. Notwithstanding, prayer also cultivates a greater awareness of the need of the gospel to those around us. Have you noticed that even in your own heart? The less you pray about the lost being saved, the the less mindful you are of the gospel, the less mindful. But praying helps us to cultivate greater awareness of the need of the gospel for those around us, that we are just not walking aimlessly Passing up opportunities, it makes us more aware of opportunities that God has placed within us. When we pray, we cultivate that awareness. It causes us to be more gospel-focused. It is prayer born out of a genuine love for God that undergirds the heart of evangelistic speech. Meditation on on the gospel Coupled with prayer for the lost, it ignites a compassionate zeal to preach the gospel to those who are perishing. It is inconsistent to desire our neighbors to be saved while we are committed and comfortable with silence. It is inconsistent to desire our neighbor to be saved while we are comfortable to and committed to silence. And so this is the prayer proclamation pattern that we see and would do well to imitate that pattern corporately and privately because prayer is a mighty means to that end. Point number two. Point number two is evangelistic speech is loving. Evangelistic speech is loving. Not only is evangelistic speech prayerful, but it is also loving. Love for the Savior is the wellspring of love for sinners. Love for the Savior is a wellspring of love to sinners. And if we are not cultivating love to Jesus, that will manifest itself in our relationships with one another as well as with the lost. If we are not cultivating love to Jesus, that will certainly manifest itself. One of the greatest hurdles to evangelism, sadly a very common experience, and one that I've seen in my own heart is lovelessness. It is lovelessness. And as Christians, when we find ourselves experiencing the awful and despicable fruit of lovelessness, of fear of man, of selfishness, of apathy or indifference and duty to the lost, 
we must not pass over that or allow it to linger in our hearts unchallenged. Isn't that easy just to, yeah, I know that's there, kind of get out of my way so I can go do more important things? Oh, lovelessness is the great cause of so much decay of godliness in our own lives. Those symptoms, those are symptoms of a greater problem. And we must recognize that the root problem of our lovelessness is one of love to God and love for His Son. It is one of love to God and love for His Son. And if that is you, ask yourself. Ask yourself, what do I need to put to death? What do I need to put to death that is choking or stopping up my love to God? What do I need to put to death What or who do I love more right now? What is producing the attitude in us, and this is the question we need to ask, what is producing the attitude in us that if we could put it into words is, I don't want to share the gospel. Love to Christ is not producing lovelessness in our evangelistic speech. Love to Christ is the greater problem. And thankfully, we are not without a remedy for our apathy. We're we're thankful for such passages like Hebrews, where the author of Hebrews, he encourages us that since we have such such a great high priest who stands before the Father, a great high priest who represents us, who intercedes for us. He says, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. He says, for what purpose? And he gives it to us. And he says, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Mercy and grace. Isn't that a world of comfort? We can go to God and get mercy and grace exactly what we need. When Christians draw near to their God in an attitude of repentance, when Christians, this is so important, when Christians draw near to their God in an attitude of repentance, they are not fearfully approaching one who sits on a throne of judgment. They are not fearfully with weak knees approaching one who sits on a throne of judgment, but they are confidently approaching one who sits on a throne of grace. The Father loves us. Therefore, beloved, let us repent of our lovelessness and gladly receive the rod of discipline and grace from a father who loves us. The deeper and stronger and more Christ-centered our religious fellowship with God, the more our love for the lost will be strengthened and purified. Love for our neighbor starts with love for God. But what is love for our neighbor? We know that love is a tangible expression or display of kindness. Love is a tangible expression or display of kindness. We know that love is selfless. Love sets self aside in order to serve. That is what it does. Essentially, love sets self aside in order to serve. Love lays itself down. It lays its life down. Love motivates good, kind, and compassionate actions. We know that love is a command to be obeyed. We know that love can increase or decrease. Paul in Philippians 1 says that he's praying for your love, that it would abound, that it would increase. Al Martin, one of my favorite theologians and 
ex-pastor, he's no longer a pastor, he's retired, he's in his 90s, who I love so much. But Al Martin, he summarized love well when he said this. He says, love, probably one of the best definitions I've heard, love is that gracious and principled disposition of goodwill. It is this internal, this loving and gracious disposition of goodwill. And he says, which desires and practically seeks the good of its object. It isn't only, it is, this love is alive. And it isn't only an internal disposition, but it also, it, since it loves, it desires to seek the good of its object. It, pra- it sees in what practical steps it might benefit another And he says, love is that gracious and principled disposition of goodwill which desires and practically seeks the good of its object even at personal cost. Love will do that. Even at personal cost. And I love that he included that in his definition, that last last portion. Because Martin's definition of love sounds very similar to what Paul set forth as the mind of Christ. In Philippians 2, 3 through 5, you can turn there if you would like. Philippians 2, 3 through 5. As we focus on love and see, look at the similarities in these definitions, theologically speaking. He says, Philippians 2, 3 through 5, Paul says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. What, an ex- what a definition of love. And he says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Love is that which conforms to the mind of Christ, and it is not selfish. Love is not selfish. Maybe in the words of 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, love does not brag, love is not arrogant, love does not act unbecomingly, love does not seek its own. Do you see the selfless element of love that it's willing to give even at personal cost? That love is selfless, it makes sense when Christ defines the highest act or display of love that one can give as ultimate selflessness. John 15, 13, Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. That one lay down his life for his friends. Friends, and if we love the lost, we will be willing to say things that have the potential to jeopardize our comfort. If we love the lost, we will be willing to love them where it costs us personally, where we have to set self aside. Don't you have to do that to love the lost? You have to set self aside. This is why we need to prepare ourselves with prayer before we enter this battlefield of so much spiritual warfare, of so much persecution, of so much opposition and suppression of faith in the exercise of godliness in the world. If we love, it will demonstrate itself because love seeks the benefit of the object of love. We are called to love our neighbor. The greatest way we can love our neighbor is invest in their lives with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the greatest gift that has ever been given. It's the greatest gift you can preach. You can't give that gift. You know what I'm saying? You can't give the gift, but it is the greatest greatest gift that we can pray for, that people would receive, and it is the greatest blessing that we can preach and communicate for others that they might possess that same blessing. So love is willing to say things 
that has the potential to jeopardize our comfort. Things that have the potential to jeopardize our safety. Things that have the potential to jeopardize our friendships. And that's because evangelistic speech sets self aside in order to seek the good of the lost. Love counts it a blessing to be persecuted for Christ's sake, not a curse. Love counts it a blessing. Therefore, you will never serve the lost well if your highest priority is you. You will never serve the lost well if your highest priority is you. If, if all of your energy goes into preserving your life, you will not risk it. You will not risk it. And that is why true love, really at the heart of it, is selfless. And it is willing to give self-sacrificially. It is an oxymoron. A selfish Christian is an oxymoron. A selfish Christian because Christians, we derive our name by virtue of our relationship with Jesus, who is the ultimate example of selflessness. He is the ultimate example of selflessness. And that leads us to point number three, that evangelistic speech is bold. Evangelistic speech is bold. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Ephesians 6, 19 through 20. Paul wrote to the Ephesians and he compelled them like this. This is another verse for prayer. He says, to pray on my behalf that utterance may be given me, that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known, he says, look at this, with boldness, the mystery of Christ. And then he adds, that I might, he says, he says, the utterance to make known the boldness, the mystery of Christ, for which he says, I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. As I ought to speak, that's how I want to speak. He says, so what is boldness? And we'll define boldness. He says, this is how I should proclaim the gospel. Boldness is speaking the truth plainly and openly in a state of boldness, confidence, courage, fearlessness. That is what boldness is. And he's saying, he says, pray that I may preach Christ openly, without hindrance, without fear, in full confidence. He says, pray that I might preach boldly, and that explains why boldness is most often a public virtue. Boldness is most often a, a public virtue that rises above what would hinder, and it rises above what would suppress the exercise of faith and courage. That is when boldness is needed, when there are obstacles that want to suppress I want to suppress your exercise of faith and preaching the gospel. And it was in those very circumstances that the New Testament church prayed this in Acts 4.29. They say, and now, Lord, and now, Lord, he says, take note of their threats. You think that might impact the way that they were preaching the gospel? Take note of their threats, he says, and grant your bondservants that we may speak your word with all confidence. That we may speak your word with all confidence. And so we may be tempted to cowardice. We will be tempted to cower and to cower in the corner and to cowardice because boldness has consequences we may not like. Because boldness has consequences that aren't comfortable to the flesh. But once we view these perceived consequences through the lens of Scripture, we begin to see that the Bible calls those consequences blessings. The Bible calls those consequences blessings and gifts from the Lord. 
that they are light momentary afflictions and that they will be worth it and in fact are not worthy to be compared with the future glory that we will receive and that we will enjoy. And further, though we live in a world of darkness, Jesus calls his disciples the light of the world in Matthew 5. And he calls us the light of the world because we illumine the hope of the world. Jesus calls us the light of the world because we illumine the hope of the world, which is Jesus Christ. And that is why Paul could say, for instance, in 2 Corinthians 3, Paul could say, he says, therefore, he says, having such a hope, meaning it's He says his boldness is based on that hope. He says, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech. It is this this boldness is befitting evangelistic speech. Boldness befits this evangelistic speech. Faith and the truth produces boldness in speech. Faith in the truth produces boldness in speech. And so if you want to grow in boldness, ask the Lord to increase your faith. Ask the Lord to increase your faith because, but because our hope is real and our hope is unshakable, it is unfitting to preach the gospel in fear. Do you see that? It is unfitting to preach the gospel in any other way than what is bold. Fear is not befitting the hope that we have. We do not preach the gospel with fear We need to ask the Lord if we are fearing to give us faith that our boldness would rise above the obstacles that want to drown out the exercise of faithfulness to God and the Lord Jesus in the world. Fearlessness befits gospel preaching, and that is because our hope is sure. The world hates Bold gospel preaching and living because it threatens their sense of moral comfort. The world hates bold gospel preaching and living because it threatens their sense of moral comfort as the Holy Spirit confronts, through the preaching, the Holy Spirit confronts them in their sin and rebellion. And that is why we must preach the gospel, and that is why we are against the world for the world. You see that? We are against the world for their sake. We endanger their sinful ease and seared consciences for this purpose, that they might believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ and trade their sinful comfort for a selfless cross. That is why we go out and preach the gospel among or amidst a world of darkness and people that hate us, that they might trade their sinful comfort for a sinless, for for a selfless cross and believe in the Lord Jesus with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so let our godly lives and gospel proclamation be a force to be reckoned with in our communities. I like what Charles Spurgeon says. He says, if sinners be damned, he says, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. And if hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let let not one go unwarned or unprayed for. We have to be bold when we speak the gospel. Fearlessness befits gospel preaching. Paul said, pray that I may preach in a way that is befitting this sure hope that we have. Isn't that amazing? Praise God. And lastly, wrapping up, this will be a shorter point. Evangelistic speech is uncompromising. Evangelistic speech is uncompromising. And this is point number four. This goes hand in hand with bold speech. We live in a world that thinks it's neutral and will do whatever it takes to get you to be their perceived neutrality, for you to 
kind of come over here. You're a little too far over here. We need you right about here. The world is not neutral. Even though they profess to be neutral, they are the furthest thing from neutral. Neutrality doesn't exist. There is no neutrality. You are either a child of God or a child of the devil. You are either, you are either a lover of Christ or a hater of Christ. You're not in the middle. No one is. No one is in the middle, but the world will do everything it can to get you to compromise what you believe and how you live. There was a recent Barna study that said this, almost half of millennials, and this is millennial practicing Christians, 47% of millennial practicing Christians agree at least somewhat that it is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith and hope that they will one day share that faith. 47% of a practicing millennial Christians believe that. You think the world has had an impact on their outlook? Just a little bit? Because you know, your truth might not be their truth. But there is only one truth, one capital T truth, and whatever competes against the capital T truth is a lie from hell. There is only one capital T truth, and whatever counterfeit truth seeks to compete against it is from the pit of hell. We must be immovable with regard to the truth. It doesn't, and it doesn't matter if the world doesn't like that. It doesn't matter if the world doesn't like that. We are against them for them. We are against the world for the world. That is why we need to remember that firmness in word is not unloving. That is why we need to remember that unwilling to compromise the truth is not unloving. That is why we must remember that being resolved to do righteousness is not unloving. That civil disobedience to authorities when they run contrary to the word of God is not unloving, nor is it disobedience in the eyes of God. Exposing lies in darkness is not unloving. Reproving a brother or neighbor because of evil is not unloving. Pleading with sinners who don't want to listen to the gospel is not unloving. Weeping for sinners who don't want to repent is not unloving. What is unloving is compromising the gospel message for your own comfort. That is what's unloving. Compromising the gospel message for your own comfort. Silence in the midst of sin is unloving. Saying nothing when the world is going to hell is unloving. What is unloving is withholding a message of rescue for those who are perishing. What is unloving is withholding a message of light to those who are sitting in darkness. What is unloving is withholding the message of justification for those who are condemned. What is unloving is withholding the message of forgiveness to those who have trespassed and offended a holy God. And, and by now, I hope you see the power and importance of evangelistic speech and why we must speak and why we must refuse to be silent. And so let us preach Christ alone for the glory of God alone. Let us preach him. Let us preach Christ. If we love sinners, then we must preach that the lost man or woman can be found, that the condemned can be justified, that the alienated can be reconciled, and that the unclean can be cleansed by the blood that flows from Manuel's veins. Amen? Amen. Oh, let us preach the gospel, brothers and sisters of Heritage Grace. 
Let us continue to preach the gospel. The world has had such an impact on us in the last couple of years. When we think about, when we think about COVID and we think about uh, just the, 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 when we think about how the world has impacted us and the, the, the sterilization, everyone just does, nobody wants to talk to anyone with a, talk to anyone before fear that they might get someone sick or touch them, or you wanted to, you just needed to live in a bubble, but you and I have to fight against that and speak the truth in love. Because the devil does not want us to boldly proclaim the gospel, but we cannot preach it any other way. We cannot preach it any other way. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we bless you and thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the the elements of evangelistic speech. Help us, Father, to put into practice prayer. Help us to walk in love. Help us to proclaim the gospel the way we ought to in boldness. And help us, Father, give us boldness to speak and to live in a way that never compromises your beautiful truth. Oh, Lord, bless Heritage Grace. We rely on you for everything. Please sustain us, Father. Please preserve us by your grace and continue to lead us in your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.